live on a Saturday talking insurance. So you might have the three biggest insurance nerds in the world uh, volunteering to spend so much time on a Saturday. Um, David, Lance, uh, welcome. Uh, David is obviously in some sort of attic. Lance is uh, ready to golf at Augusta. <laughs> and I had, uh, I'm cleaning up from a tornado. Boo! So uh, pardon, pardon the appearance. Uh, guys, happy Saturday. Happy Saturday, happy Saturday Nick. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just to give the audience a flavor of um, how nerdy we are and who, but you know, who we are. Uh, David, why don't you start? Give a, you know, give a quick elevator pitch and then uh, Lance off to you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm David McFarland, CEO of Coterie Applications, Inc. Uh, we just call ourselves Coterie. And I'm a fellow in the Casualty Actuarial Society, large background in the insurance space. Uh, prior to Coterie, I was working with ClearCover, a chief actuary, head of insurance product there. And prior to that, just heavy on various lines in insurance. Uh, as far as what we do at Coterie, we, we use modern tech to make it super easy to integrate commercial insurance in places where it's relevant to people. Uh, so this really involves building out our own tech, our own insurance products, and hooking them into to places where it has a lot of data that we need to write and rate the policies and kind of make it easy on the end customer and get some interesting data while we're at it. Excellent. Lent? Cool. Thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, so Lance Poole, CEO of Juniper Labs, uh, like David, I'm also an actuary by training. Uh, Nick, I think you've got the good fortune to have two actuaries on today that, that look at other people's shoes instead of our own. Um, that's how you know we're the, out, the uh, outgoing actuaries. Yeah. Um, so I uh, spent the uh, first 10 years of my career um, working in the life and annuity world. Um, launched a tech startup in digital mortgage. Um, and have recently transitioned to, to launch Juniper Labs and so focused on commercial insurance. Um, and just a uh, quick uh, intro on Juniper. We help make the small business segment more profitable for commercial insurers, insure techs and brokers. And so we're using a combination of open data and machine learning to build data products and automated underwriting tech. Um, so for instance, if you're an insure tech and you're looking to enter a new market, we can help with customer experience challenges like pre-fill or strategic problems like understanding where openings might be from a product and pricing perspective. Yep. Um, so we, we got a really good background here of everybody. Um, I'm, I'm the non-actuary, so uh, that means there's a lot of pressure on me to keep the conversation moving. Uh, just kidding, guys. Um, no, but you guys have um, both you know the mathematical background but also the technical ones in that um, you've either been with other startups or, you know, had, you have more experience than what you're doing now in the startup area. So, um, you know, Lance and I were chatting and we thought this would be fun to have a conversation between the three of us. And I thought, you know, potentially kick it off with current events. And so it's just hard in this environment to not talk about the pandemic. And I think, um, I think it was Lance's podcast that kind of spurred some deeper thinking on my end regarding the impact. Mm -hmm. I think most of the impact I've seen has been very shallow, but I think it, I think Lance, it was you on Nigel's podcast that talked about workers comp and talked about you know, beyond just potentially claims that pop up today, um, whether they're covered or not, but the future of comp and how, this could lead to mo more co comorbidity and increased rates going forward because now we have a bunch of the population that's injured. So we don't have to necessarily talk about comp, but this this is the this could be the defining event that changes automobile insurance, um, property insurance. Like this is going to touch a lot of different areas. So Lance, let's, let's start with you. Like your Let's let's go let's go second third order thinking here on the effects of what this is going to do to the industry. Yeah, it's super interesting. You know, we you, what we've seen is that we're pretty bad at predicting the future. <laughs> and you have two actuaries on who um, a lot of what we do is potentially trying to predict or model um, what's going to happen. Um, and so yeah, it's interesting to think about um, you know what's going to happen with you know a line like workers comp where claims, you know, are a longer tail 
um, you know, happen out in the future, um, what's the impact going to be of coronavirus? I mean, there's just the report today from the World Health Organization is that getting the getting getting COVID-19 doesn't protect you from getting reinfected, right? Um, and so we're learning something new every day in terms of the impact of the virus. And it's tough to know what's that going to do to people's immune systems, you know, two, three years from now. And what's that going to do to claims? How long is an injured worker going to be out of work because they're potentially sick? Um, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting to think about all the unknowns that are out there for insurance companies. I mean, insurance executives are, are typically people who worry about things they don't know. Um, so, yeah, I think this is all likely creating a lot of anxiety um, for uh, people that are, you know, in charge at carriers and Intratex and other, other companies. Mm -hmm. David? Yeah. Yeah. Workers' comp is fascinating. Uh, and if, if we just look at like, before we even get into second and third order, like what's happening right now. So what, what is the, what's yeah. the uh, we have a lot of businesses going under and, you know, commensurate with that, a lot of people being laid off. Uh, so in the workers' comp space, like what's the exposure base for workers' comp? It's payroll, right? So like mass amounts of payroll are now going outside of the markets. We're going to have huge decreases in premium, which is not ideal if you're an insurance company. Uh, commensurately, you're eventually you're going to have um, rehiring, right? Like we'll have a, a resurgence. Hopefully, people are going to be brought back on. Um, but also, there's redeployment of skill sets. Now, anytime you have rehiring outside of a recession or coming out of a recession or redeployment of skill sets, usually the employers are. By, by virtue of the fact that they're hiring people, they're less talented at the job they're being hired for. And so you have claims go up. So you're gonna have this, this mix of things where we have you know, a large decrease in workers' comp premium. Wow, once, once things start getting better, you're gonna have an increase in claims. Uh, couple that with the fact that you know, bonds are not really yielding the highest amounts and the stock isn't really generating returns. You're gonna have these insurance companies being like, where are we gonna get our money from? They're going to get their money from increasing the rates, especially since like workers' comp has consistently been going down year over year. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, granted, like NCCI is really the, you know, the, the controlling arm and you know, where the rates go, but insurance companies can still file LCMs and all that kind of stuff. So I'd, I'd anticipate that second, third order, like longer term, we're going to see workers' comp rates go up. Uh, kind of make up for the, the decrease in premium and the fact that they're not really getting much return and eventually the, the spike in claims. Uh, but yeah, who knows? They, they could see such great loss experience over this period where no one's really doing anything, but I, I don't think that's going to be the case because the premium audit will end up bringing the, the premium down significantly. Well, you have so, in, in, a lot of, in a lot of cases, right, you have, there's this transition to, essential workers yeah yeah right and so as as you were talking david i started to imagine um what if um we have extensive unemployment for a considerable period of time Let, let's just let's just imagine like great depression level unemployment 20 percent range for an extended period of time yeah um and you know there's already this political push to sort of give some benefits to these essential workers, um, more pay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what you're saying makes sense. What, what you would end up seeing is a lot of folks that have a particular skill, um, including selling themselves, um, deciding I need a job. I'm going to, uh, you know, there are people hiring for these essential slots. I'm going to go fill one of those, even though I've never done that before. Yeah, never you know, done so it could be working. Yeah. yeah. It could be a work, uh, a warehouse, a uh, truck driver, uh, things that they have never done before. Now, um, you know, the, we've had a very stable economy, stable, fairly stable rates, uh, stable connection of loss costs to rates over time. And now that could be severed. Yep. And we yeah. have, it's disjointed. It, it, there's going to be a whole bunch of these things that are sort of going to be disjointed. Even if we have a U recovery, it's going to be kind of broken for a while. Yep. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, just look at, look at, it, it's like we have all these workers who are laid off, right? And so now they're going to be redeployed in these essential skill sets. And I mean, even look at things like, even just look at 
I don't want to say non-essential, but not as essential services that are now in high demand, right? Everyone is doing improvements to their home. They're buying furniture, right? Like Wayfair went up by like 48%. Well, you're going to have more people who are going to go into like furniture manufacturing who have never done it before, right? Mm -hmm. Or it's doing freelance work on these home services marketplaces. And uh, it's, it's going to result in a different types of claims experience on yeah. the workers' comp side. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll be interesting. Yeah, there's a big push to go local. Yep. So you're right. Like I, I, I hadn't even connected those dots where if by chance there's this uh, disconnect from society where it's like, okay, you know, we've been aggregating in these big cities. Now there's going to be, a, uh, uh, you know, emigration to, you know, the, the rural areas of the yeah. country where all of a sudden people are going to become farmers yep. and furniture makers like that, that it's, I, I, maybe, maybe not, but it's, it, uh, if you said that a year ago, I would have laughed yeah. now. Yeah. Like there, there's actually a pathway where, uh, the folks that do farming or furniture making or, you know, become artists or whatever could increase by double digit percentages. Yeah. Um, that's how <laughs> crazy this time is. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, just looking at, looking at the various things we're seeing just now about the areas that people are going into, like what, what people are demanding, like puzzles are through the roof. I literally cannot buy a puzzle. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but all this stuff, like we like to spend money and we'll spend money to keep ourselves entertained in various things. So that's where the jobs are going to go. If, um, if Hollywood can't uh, record, right, then there's going to be a need for people to uh, you know, like homemade movies, you know, uh, low, low quality. But, um, you know, there's Netflix is, uh, I think Netflix just um, tried to raise like a billion dollars of debt um, to invest in more content. Hmm. I mean, that's their entire business model. And yeah. so if, if, if there's not, like if Reese, Reese Witherspoon is not creating a new uh, series, who's going to do it? Yeah, yeah. What's the what's the sports equivalent of that, Nick? Are we going to see, um, you know, backyard football being broadcast? <laughs> well, they're already talking about um, games with no fans in the right. stadium. Right. Yeah. You know, can you imagine an NFL game? Hey, have, have you guys watched the NFL draft? Uh, yeah, I, I've I, seen a I've seen a bit of it. Yeah. Um, it was better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, Roger Goodell is just an awkward dude, but. Outside of that, they actually, I thought they did a fairly good job. I think you could, you could see someone uh, more content or entertainment around that sort of, um, you know, uh, recording, broadcasting, you know, kind of like this. How do we make this more entertaining? Well, Lance could turn around, like actually like start bouncing a ball off a golf club and then giving it a whack and it actually lands on the green. That's so, right. Um, so uh, comps one area auto, um, it 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 just seems inevitable that the work from home thing is going to uh, take hold. It's it'll it, it's going to be it's a real thing, yeah. right? So what percentage of personal auto driving mileage will go down? I have not driven my car in like forever. Um, yeah, I've it's probably been two months since I've had to get gas. Same. Yeah. And if we did, it'd be like 50 cents a gallon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like another line where exposures are going way down. Um, and like you're saying, Nick, it might not just be a temporary shift. Um, there's going to be some permanence there. So yeah, if you're auto carrier, what do you do? Like you were a year ago, you were worried about in a distant future, self-driving cars, yeah. may the need for auto insurance. Um, and now we've like fast forward several years and we're seeing, you know, a much less reduced uh, need for auto insurance. Yeah. What's, what's the size of the auto personal auto market? It's like 280 billion. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah it's, it's could, could it, could it, could it get down to under 200 billion under 150 billion? Like, could it, could it be reduced by 50%? I, I mean, if things stay the way they are right now, yes, right? Like we will have to dramatically reduce the, the lost cost because the exposure is just not there. No, no one's really driving. Um, but like there, there's, there's a ton, there's so many other factors, right? Like 
so first like the exposure like how many miles we're driving specifically but also just look at look at what's going on right now right we have uh 25 million people roughly who have filed for unemployment third people missed their uh missed their rent payment in in march or uh, april sorry and I'd imagine that you know all this is impacting the private passenger auto people as well. I mean, it's a pretty hefty premium to pay. Yeah. Um, and so what you're going to have is you're going to have a large group of financially responsible people who a bad instance has happened to them that was you know, fairly uh, uncommon in their life, probably up to this point, who are probably good drivers, right? Um, but now they're letting their car insurance lapse. Right, and they may be suffering certain other financial responsibility hits on their credit. Well, look at every model that's out there on the private passenger auto side. Progressive, Geico, everybody. It's all based off what? Like financial yeah. responsibility score, household makeup, yeah. right. lapses in your insurance. And now you're gonna have all these good drivers coming coming into their data set where it's like, oh, well, we've got to reject all these guys because they all have lapses and they all have bad credit. Like, no, these are good drivers. So like the one who's going to win is going to be the guy who thinks about it beforehand, figures out how to monkey around with his model. So he's not rejecting these good drivers that that's going to be super interesting. Do you, so you have a background in auto yeah. doing this do, is do the progressives and the Geico's of the world have it within them to, to actually do this. My guess is given the size and given how, you know how much um, inertia has has developed with their current system. That it, you know it would take a long it would take a long time for them to decide. Okay, yeah, we we should we should anticipate what you just described. Yeah, and I think I think it'll stop there, right? It'll be like we should anticipate what you described, but to your point, <laughs> it, it may not make past those words. Um, and I I could be wrong. I, I don't have a lot of faith in their ability to move quickly with regard to this because i mean they're, they're huge right that yeah, yeah it'll take an act of parliament um but you know i to what we were talking about earlier like who has an advantage here like insure techs or legacy i i think insure techs insure techs have the ability to be very nimble and to make adjustments uh to to underwriting and rating models and you know, hopefully they'll um, they'll be able to take on these these good insurers even and really spot them. Finding them is going to be difficult, um, but at least I think they'll be able to receive them in a way. Didn't Metro Mile just like lay off like a quarter of their workforce? Yeah, they laid off a ton of people. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think you'll see that from a lot of the insure techs because they're trying to conserve capital, got 18 months of runway, how do I stretch that to 24? Um, I haven't seen any layoffs from Root yet. Um, they have. They, they, they've laid off. They have. Okay. yes. Yeah, so it seems like everyone that's bigger um, is having to make some cuts like that. But I think to David's point, you know, they're in a better position to make changes and potentially grow um, in the coming months because yeah, folks are going to go get an auto quote when they need to drive again, and it's going to be two or three times what it was before, and they'll start looking around and maybe you know, routes a more attractive op option at that point. Yeah. Have you guys heard of Just Auto? No, I haven't heard of Just Auto. Yeah, so I just I just interviewed the CEO. So uh, I think they're only in Arizona, but they're based out of Southern California. And uh, I so I interviewed him for for uh, this podcast, and uh, I brought that up. I brought it up. You know, um, your business model is completely designed around uh, telematics and uh, mileage based pricing, mm -hmm. and but now nobody's driving. <laughs> Isn't that a harm to your model? And uh, he had the opposite feeling. He said, yeah, of course, you know, if they drive less, it's less premium. He's like, but it's also fewer claims. And he, he sort of described it as a, you know, social function, what he's doing that um, to your point, Lance, once they, once folks start coming back, um, they, they may not want traditional auto insurance. Right. They, they, there may be more working from home and they, might be more open to mileage based rating. Yeah. And so he, he's sort of positioning himself and the company um, in that regard in that um, this will be the one. 
that you know Metro Mile and Route have not really succeeded because they try to implement uh, mileage based into a traditional uh, auto model, and his their entire tech platform is based off of mileage based. Mm -hmm. That is how they charge, and they actually charge by the month. Okay. So month by month, as you drive, your 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 balance is going up and down. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's a completely different model. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share some info with you guys on that later, but it, 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 it's that opportunity, right? Like the, the state farms of the world could never do execute on this, Oh no! but a startup that has a little bit of runway, um, has, has the ability to, um, to execute on it because there are fewer obstacles in their way. But, and like you said, uh, like state farm also is the fact that it, I, I do not want to be disparaging against independent agents. Like agents are fantastic. They do an amazing job, but just simply because of the fact that we're having this social distancing is, is an impediment to how they conduct business, right? Like at this point and going forward, there is going to be some hesitancy, right? Of people going into someone's office to get auto insurance, especially, or any insurance, especially when you can do it right from your computer, right? So I, I imagine, um, this will probably accelerate the number of people who are going to be shopping online for insurance and couple that with the fact that like the people who are shopping probably had a lapse or something and you know they're going to get hit from all the other bad guys so the insure tax will be right there ready to take them especially yeah. guys who are doing true mileage based yeah any any business with physical space these days it's it's like a, a serious liability um so it's interesting thing about if you have a, you know, if you're a carrier and there's tons and tons of offices, you know, if you've got a captive agency or even, you know, you have a big agency that has uh, offices around the country, um, people aren't going there. And so yeah. it's just sitting there empty and, you know, that's, it will be temporary. I think we may be at a future two years from now when people do go back to the office, people are at Starbucks. We don't know how long that's going to be, but for the, the short term, it's, it's a liability to have physical space, physical presence. In both in both ways, right? A liability to your business model, but also a liability like a yeah, yeah, legal, legal legal liability. Yeah, yeah you know, for sure, right? To, for for your employees, um, and for others, if one of your employees gets a customer or someone who comes in sick. Yeah, yeah. that's right. You know, why were you open? Um, so, it, something I was thinking about this morning, I um. I was, I wanted to tweet about it, but I wanted to have this conversation first and kind of think about it a little bit more, which, which is there's a lot of lawsuits to the PNC carriers to cover this for business interruption. Yeah. Now, um, you're already starting to see, uh, Arch, AXA, a couple others have already said there, they, they, there will, there will be a financial consequence. Um, so a lot of these companies, I think, see the writing on the wall and are kind of going through their policies and saying, listen, anything that's ambiguous, we have to, it's not worth the court costs yeah. for this. So let's kind of pay this out. So I think Arch had a hundred million dollar, um, they're going to add a hundred million dollars to their reserves uh, to accommodate this. So how do you guys think this is going to play out? That, that one's tough. Uh, so post SARS, I, most insurance companies added the pandemic exclusion, so communicable diseases exclusion to yep. all policies associated you know, with this. Um, and because we saw what happened in, to insurance companies over in Asia, I mean, it, it wrecked them. Um, it, it, was a, it was a serious, serious thing. And we knew that like, we, we can't cover this. And we were, you know, the, the exclusion is very specific. It's right there in the policy. But the thing is, it's like no one really reads the policy, yep. right? Um, and now we're at this point where we had this big pandemic and people are talking about like, well, you know, what are we going to do? Do we, are, are the, the states going to make this retroactive liability for insurance companies? And if, I mean, if they do, uh, that's going to be tough. Be, like, it's one thing to just like pay it out, right? Like just say like, all right, we'll, we'll cover you. But if they expect to just have this built into the insurance policy going forward, it's going to, uh, it'll raise rates significantly has to yeah, yeah. there's already been pandemic you know coverage out there and it was so expensive that no one would buy it yeah. um, 
So I think that's the, and you know, most businesses, if they were honest, we said, Hey, we can add this to your policy for $25,000 a year. Do you want it? Um, no one would, would take it. <laughs> so I agree, you know, we can't, it's not going to, not going to get added. And, and yeah, if the, if the government goes too far, if, if state insurance commissioners go too far, there's you know going to be another bailout on their hands um, because yeah, the carriers won't make it through it. And we kind of had this happen, and not not at this scale, uh, but we kind of had this happen post 9/11, right? We had terrorism exclusions on all these policies, and then after that, the United States uh, at a federal level basically said like. We, we've got to do something. We have to have some type of pot over here that's going to going to pay out if, if a terrorist event happens to, to protect these businesses. And so we had you know, TRIA uh, introduced, so it's actually like three percent on all, all premiums. And that that may be a way going forward. Um, um, you know, maybe some type of pandemic fund at a federal level, but I'm, I have no idea if that's actually going to happen. We'll see. Yeah. So that that brings up the other point, which is. Um, where, where I was kind of imagining this, this going is if I were an attorney, I would push for my clients to get the declination letter as soon as possible. I think there might be a bigger pot going after the brokers. Oh, uh, like you know, exposure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it, because you don't have to prove the exclusion. Yeah. All you have to prove is that like, this was never even offered to me. Yeah. Right. Like Lance, what you just said, it was, it wasn't even offered to me. Therefore, right. it's the broker's fault that I don't have, they, they, they were not the trusted advisor that I thought they were. I think that's an easier hurdle to jump over. Maybe. It, it's, it, there's, there's some idea of like the amount of uh, like care and diligence that they put into it. And since like it was ubiquitous, like everyone did it, maybe except for like the risk manager of Wimbledon. I mean, I'm sure you saw that. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and maybe that could get, but to your point, like it's, it's going to be jury based, right? And these guys are just going to probably land blast the agents and, and insurance companies and make them pay. That's what happens a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. It, I, either way, it, 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 now it opens up, uh, you know, Pandora's box around how agents and brokers need to behave and, you know, um, what else are we not trying to sell that we should be selling that, you know, uh, meteor co coverage. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, like honestly, like, you know, we, we live in the United States. We really don't have to worry about this too much except in the Pacific Northwest, but like volcanic eruption coverage. Although yeah. that's, I think that's in most property policies. It's there, there's a going to be a complete reevaluation of this. And uh, one of the things I think is like really interesting since Lance, you have, um, you know, actuarial experience on the, on the life side, um, just with, with your degree, um, life insurance stocks took a beating when this, mm -hmm. when the pandemic first came, yep. like got slashed by more than 50%. And ironically, net net, there may not be any new additional deaths this right. year because of the number of car accidents that have gone down. Um, you know, aside from is, did they actually die from this, from COVID-19, but let's assume they didn't like bucket flus and stuff like that. This, um, the shelter in place would automatically reduce other viral infections. Right. And so like the, the one, uh, insurance arena that you thought might really take it on the chin and really suffer may actually come out. And, and, um, Lance, was it your your white paper um, on the uh, on the Spanish flu? Wasn't that the like the impetus for the life insurance industry of the 20th century? Yeah, there's a lot of growth because of that. And, and, and anecdotally, I've heard from carriers in the life world too. They've seen applications go up because of this. Yeah, you know, folks are having that conversation: should we buy life insurance? And so there are more policies. And like you say, a lot of the deaths are occurring to people who are older, who are sicker, who likely weren't covered. Um, you know, or it was kind of expected that they would die yeah. in the next few years too. So yeah, I completely agree. A lot of the, a lot of the beating, you know, David made a point earlier that, that just the, the conditions in the markets are not favorable for life insurers. Part of the way insurers make, make money is take that premium you give them and invest them in, you know, typically bonds and, um, you know, fixed income assets. And so not a lot of yield there. So that's the other thing that's kind of hampering 
uh, carriers from making money these days is the financial markets. David? Oh, no, I, I agree completely. Uh, I think we're going to see a huge volume spike in the life insurance space. And to Lance's point, the people who are mainly dying are 65 plus, and most of them you know, don't don't necessarily have life insurance. And so, or it was expected. You yeah. know, the 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 uh, life tables were like, okay, well, there's not a lot of years left in this, anyways. So, yep. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and then and then if you write annuities too, you end up actually in a better position because the risk for annuities is longevity, and so it's older people that are living a lot longer than you'd expected, and so there could be. Um, you know, some small, some small pickup there yeah. um, for annuity carriers. Yeah. So um, the, I want to kind of transition a little bit. This is uh, not specific to life, but um, the uh, May contract for oil went negative. Yeah. I don't know if you guys saw that. Yeah, I saw that. So yeah. there were people desperately paying others to not deliver. Like I, I, I bought this oil contract, but I will actually pay you to not show up with in a, in a tanker um, with the oil. So um, what's, what's interesting about that and where the insurance tie-in is um, with interest rates. So uh, we've seen it in Europe and in, in other parts of the world where there are negative interest rates where you actually pay your bank, pay your government to hold your money. Um, I, I, I'm not, I can't even fathom what, what does that, what does a negative interest rate do to, I know life insurance is really sensitive to interest rates, but they're all investing in something. What does a negative interest rate do to pricing capacity, business models and insurance? It, it, uh, the short answer is it increases the rate because <laughs> yeah. they're not going to make the money off of the money they're investing. So they're going to make it off the customer. So they, they've either got to figure out how to reduce expenses, right? Like keep, they can either keep the rate the same and reduce the expenses. Uh, they can reduce the expected losses. So arguably like per private passenger auto, the expected losses are going to be reduced in the future, right? But reduce the expenses, reduce the expected losses or like, you know, you just increase the rate. Those are, those are really your options. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's not good, right? Um, the, the thing that I think I'm, I'm holding in tension here is this phrase of this too shall pass that at some point um, down the road, we'll, we'll feel like, okay, we're back to some sense of normal, some new normal, some next normal, whatever term we want to, we want to call that. But uh, in the short term, whether that's the next three months, the next two years, I mean, we're in store for some bumps, you know, there's all these dynamics we're talking about. And, we haven't mentioned too many things yet on this podcast that are good news. Um, and because well, of, because there's because so much the, uncertainty, right. right? It's like, we, we don't know. Right. We're going into uh, a time, you know, um, there've been plagues before and they've disrupted things, but this is the first plague in uh, a modern environment. I, I remember reading, uh, I read a tweet that said, could you imagine this occurring like 20 years ago, pre-internet? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. What would we do? How would information get spread? Like, it's, um, it's a world. Maybe we're almost fortunate that it happened um, when it happened and we have the ability to work from home and do a, a you know, get, get content. So we're not, you know, um, having to carve out our own puzzles out of cardboard. <laughs> well, you know? If I can't um, get a if I can't get a puzzle pretty soon, I'll, I'll be I'll be doing that myself. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll ship you one we have, David. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I, another little financial twist uh, that I read yesterday as well, which is um, Black Shoals Black Shoals option model for options, um, which is used um, in the derivatives trading to hedge certain things uh, cannot accept negative interest rate values. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you have bankers and others who are desperately looking for other option models that can handle that. Like it, it all of these small nuances that are just throwing, it, it's one, it's uh, death by a thousand stings, you know, yeah. like we're just getting one little curveball after another, like, Oh, we, we never anticipated that. Right. Yeah. So, what, this kind of gets into like every a lot of what we've built today is just like data goes into the machine. 
we learn from it, we put out a number, right? And what we're seeing is like, we now have this black swan event, this huge anomaly, right? That is feeding data and it's impacting all these various areas. So we're getting unique types of, I say unique, different types of data in, into, these, into these machines. And it's spinning out things we don't really understand. And this is, this is interesting from two, two perspectives. So first off, it's going to make us like reevaluate how we use these, these tools, yeah. um, which that'll be interesting. But the, the kind of negative side is, is we've been like fighting against, especially in like legacy insurance, um, fighting against the use of like insurance as an art uh, and Lance, you probably know this, and like trend selection and all this other nonsense. Right. Like how, how you set rates, like these actuaries and product managers, it's like, well, this trend could either be here or here, and it makes the rate either go to like a plus 15 or like a minus three. And now we have this giant anomaly that's gonna be coming into these systems. And I, I have a feeling it's gonna push things back about 15 years to the age of you know, insurance as an art, and this is going to create more underwriting cycles in the future, uh, except for the ones, you know, like, like Berkshire companies who do a really good job of like being systematic rather than subjective with, with what they have. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's an opportunity. Yeah, I agree. You know, like it, it's, I look at it, there was, um, you know, there's huge advantage for some of, some of these firms with a lot of, you know, a lot of assets, a lot of capital. Um, and, you know, I think for the most part, you know, State Farm went a uh, considerable period of time where they were either on the underwriting side, they were either breaking even or losing money, but they were making it, making it up on their float. So um, because of the size of the, the uh, personal auto market, you know, 280, $300 billion um, of annual premium, you know, that's what, that's what Warren Buffett's in it for. You know, he's not in it for the gigantic underwriting profit because that doesn't exist in auto. He's in it to get cash to then invest in other things. It, uh, the model's going to get flipped upside down. And, um, you know, I've seen it in the property market where, because um, I, I spend most of my time in that cat, you, you can't go after the premium. You always blow up if you go yeah. after the premium. Like you have to find the niche. There's no, there's no net that you can throw over something and say, I want, I want all of that. That doesn't exist. Yeah. And I think we're going to start seeing that in a lot of these different areas where, where to your point, David, it's um, beyond just the rate making, like the, yeah. um, the, sele the risk selection. Yeah. Like now with a magnifying glass, instead of we want everyone in the zip code do we? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, um, brave new world. Um, thanks guys. This was, uh, this was really geeky. I felt <laughs> like we could, I felt like we could get more geeky on it. Um, but this was, uh, this was interesting. It got me, got me really thinking. Oh, this was super fun. Uh, good get to talk insurance with a, with a couple of insurance veterans. It's all, always nice to do on a Saturday. Yeah. Like you oh. said, Nick, there's um, you know, probably two hours more of a riffing we could, we could take on, uh, you know, what's going to happen with the world. Yeah. Here. It, you know, what might be fun and interesting rather than like a question answer and have this is um, maybe a hackathon, right? Like we get a bunch of us folks and we sort of um, go, go through a product design on mm -hmm what this might mean. And so have the, have the, you know, the actuaries who can provide some analytical and mathematical muscle and some others, and we'll get some claims people and we could sort of uh, hack together uh, a, a new entity that will rise like a Phoenix <laughs> out of, out of this. I don't know. I, it, honestly, I, I, when, I, when, um, as this event has unfolded, I can't help but think when, uh, the 19, 1994 Northridge, 1994, Northridge earthquake occurred mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And the earthquake market and the property market in California was like vanishing. Yep. Right. And so the state of California decided to create the California earthquake, earthquake authority to provide some stability to the market in some earthquake capacity. 
and Warren Buffett stepped forward and wrote a billion dollar, the first billion dollar policy limit. Um, he wrote a billion dollars of reinsurance coverage on that, and he got paid four hundred million dollars. I, I love Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> right, and for a um, for an event, I may I may be wrong with the four hundred million. I might actually be confusing that with the billion dollar coverage he wrote for the Sears Tower after nine eleven. Oh, yeah. Either way, he's always stepped forward after these events. When there's blood in the streets, he's always stepped forward and got these absolutely ridiculous rates online. And I'm yep. thinking for an, a really smart insurer, I would be open to offering event cancellation coverage where you know your maximum exposure and you know for like a million dollars in coverage, someone might give you $100,000, $200,000 of premium. It, if you're not going to kowtow to the underwriting cycle, this is when you're going to make tons of money, right? Like price adequately all the time, consistently. Don't go off this judgment. Don't, you know, don't tell me what they're going to do. That also means if you're going to make hay now, you've also got to be willing to give up when the cycle turns down, right? And everyone's just giving away rate, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it's a disciplined approach and it's one that everyone wants to do when there's, you know, time to make money in these crazy yeah. times of course you yeah. have to be, you have to be kind of willing to run into the fire when everyone's running out <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully warren buffett has a, a pretty nice uh, cash cushion to be able to do that yeah. too yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome uh let's pick it up again cool okay all right to uh to everyone watching lance david thank you yeah thanks nick Enjoy it. Super fun. and so my fellow americans Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country.